You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature webcast and podcast series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives take an in-depth look at insights on the issues of our time, the things that matter most to our business leaders. We'll sit down with thought leaders and experts on a variety of topics and do what we do best at the conference board, provide trusted insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin, the CEO of the conference board and the host of this series. And in today's conversation, we're gonna talk about sustainability in times of stress, like the times we've been in in the last couple of years. What is the status of sustainability? What should companies be thinking about? Where are we going with it? Joining me today is Paul Washington, a leading voice in sustainability and corporate citizenship matters. He is the executive director and leader of the Center for ESG at the Conference Board. Welcome. Thank you. Delighted to be with you, Steve. So we have to sort of go pre-COVID and Mm -hmm. then post-COVID. So let's just describe the environment and the focus of sustainability before COVID. Sure. You know, sustainability started as a is an idea in the corporate world, you know, decades ago. And I would say it had pretty much a green tinge, you know, it was largely focused on environmental issues. But in the last decade, I think we've seen three broad trends. The first is a a broadening of the definition of sustainability. It's no longer just focused on environmental issues. It includes social issues as well. And it's really focused on on the long-term sustainability of the company, society at large, and the natural environment. So sustainability is a broader concept than in the past. Second broad trend is it's moved beyond compliance. Okay, you've got to do what the law requires. And it's moved even beyond sort of risk mitigation. And it now includes um, more focus on cost reduction and even revenue opportunities. And I think this is where US companies in particular may have an advantage over some of their European competitors in seizing some of those opportunities. And then I think the third thing is sustainability has gone from something that was siloed within companies to becoming increasingly integrated into the company's business strategy. So those are three broad trends of what's happening. Yeah, and it, and it sort of started out as the do-gooders, yeah. you know, and, and companies were getting criticized yeah. for their environmental records and all that. So what do we do? All right, well, let's get a do-gooder and we'll bring them in. Yeah. And it was a cost because it's going to increase. Yeah. That world, I mean, that's just like ancient history. It, it certainly is. And look, you know, there's been a change in the dynamic, too, between companies, nonprofits, the new do-gooder nonprofits, and um, regulation. Companies are now actually leading in this area. And rather than being prodded by the nonprofits, they're often partnering with them. The other thing that's happened is that regulation is no longer leading the way, it's actually lagging companies here. And that creates a risk that as companies are looking at sustainability as a business strategy matter, they can get dragged back into thinking about sustainability as a compliance matter. And that's not good. I'll give you a very practical example. I was talking to the general counsel of a leading company and she said, you know what? Because of the new SEC disclosure rules, I have to take a lawyer who's going to help us work on sustainability growth opportunities, and they're spending all their time now working on complying with the SEC disclosure. Well, you know, it, it, is, it is interesting um, to look back because, you know, when you look forward, you go, oh, we want, we're trying to get to a zero carbon world. Mm-hmm. We've got so far to go, you know. But, you know, just in our careers, I mean, we've come along. Right. I mean, remember when the Cuyahoga River mm-hmm. caught fire? I mean, right. Yes. A river catching fire. <laughs> there was right. stuff in there, you know, and companies were, were dumping, um, yeah. you know, refuse right into water supplies, yeah. you know, unfiltered, you know, air. You, you couldn't even see across some city. I mean, so oh. the, the, the pollution, the environment, the waste, you know, it was just terrible. And today it's better than No, terrible. it is certainly better. And you know what? There's some research from the... Um, uh, conference boards marketing communication center that indicates that you know consumers are recognizing the progress they're seeing the progress that companies are making they're recognizing the leadership that companies are exerting and sure there's a lot more to be done 
but we're, we're starting from a much different place. And frankly, companies approach to this because it's no longer, okay, we just comply with the Clean Air Act or Clean Water Act or something. They're actually embracing this as a business imperative. Um, I think we're going to continue to make progress. And, and I think, you know, this is part and parcel to a multi-stakeholder world. You know, when, yeah. when business leaders were focused solely on shareholders, you didn't quite, yeah. you know, think about, but when you start thinking about a multi, which includes multi-stakeholder world, finish my sentence, which <laughs> me, includes customers, employees, owners, the environment, society, you know, you start saying, holy cow, we've got, you know, we've got obligations here. And, and I, I don't know of a business leader today who doesn't, who is not completely engaged and focused on that broad set. Right. And it's a great prism to look at your business decisions, whether it's your business strategy, your capital allocation, you know, M&A, to look at it through the prism you just said, okay, if we're going to do a transaction, what does it mean for obviously the company's financial performance, but what does it mean for our customers, our employees, our communities? What does it mean for society at large, actually? And what does it mean for the natural environment? Are we buying a company that actually has a bad environmental track record? Can we help make it better? Which could be a reason to do the deal. You know, that broadening of the aperture, I think leads, it's sometimes more challenging, but I think it leads to better long-term performance. You know, it, uh, black swan events used to be described as something that happened once in a lifetime and you couldn't predict them. And I, you know, if you just look back over the past three years, it, it feels like we've had three black yeah, swans. Yeah, I don't know. Is it, is, it a, is it a gaggle? Is it a flock? I'm not sure what swans are, but we've <laughs> definitely, we've got a, or, a, you know, whatever it might be called, we've got a bunch of them. It's a big honking problem. <laughs> yeah, it's a big honking problem. But, you know, three of them. So the world has changed in this, in this past couple of years, yeah. you know, with, with certainly the pandemic, you know, the social justice issues, and now, you know, a war in Eastern Europe. Describe now the, the strains on, you know, a focus on sustainability while all of this other stuff is happening. Sure. Um, a, a few thoughts. The first is we did a survey and put out a piece in spring of 2020 about what general counsel and chief investment relations officers thought the impact would be of the pandemic on sustainability. Half got it right, half got it wrong. Yeah. 37% said it would shift the focus of sustainability. They were right. Another 10% said it would increase the focus on sustainability. They were right. The folks who said that it was going to decrease the emphasis, put it on hold, or have little or no effect, did not get it right. Because what we've seen is that there has been a shift during these times of stress, actually to focus more on social issues. I think that's big. It's not just the environmental issues, it's social issues. So employee health and safety used to be concern of mining companies and folks like that. Now employee health and safety concern, top concern of, of all companies. Racial equality after 2020, you know, that is now we know from our C-suite outlook survey we did at the conference board, it's the number two social priority for CEOs in the right. US. Supply chain resilience and responsibility so important. Right. So there's been this broadening of it. Uh, you know, at the same time, people have had to make trade-offs. They're having to say, "All right, you know, we can't, we can't maybe move to energy independence right now because we have to shift sources of fossil fuels in Europe, for example, because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Right, supply issues. But you know, it's actually lighting a fire." for increasing um, in the emphasis on renewable energy and alternative sources in the long run. Yeah, you know, this, and, and, and people, you know, I, I remember April 1970, I marched in the very yeah. first Earth Day. The whole point of sustainability was environmentalism and, and the pollution, but sustainability is much broader today. It, it is, and you know, and you know who recognizes that maybe even more than sometimes companies are consumers. There's actually a little and bit employees. of and employees who are often one and the same, right? Exactly. And, you know, the number one issues, uh, number one, number two issues for um, employees and consumers when it comes to sustainability, yeah. Yeah. fair wages and fair labor conditions. Those that doesn't book, sound like a sustainability. But it is because our entire system, our entire economic system, and frankly, our political system that you know relies on a stable and growing economy, um, are imperiled if we don't actually have a sense 
that people are paid fairly and working in fair labor conditions. So your point is human capital yeah. is, you know, is the backbone of this yeah. country now yeah. in a knowledge-based economy. Yeah. And so therefore the sustainability of that human capital is paramount for individual companies and for our entire economic system. Wow. I'm not sure people really have thought about it that way, but, but you're right. It sometimes no, it's it, a major shift. And I think companies are still grappling with this concept, you know, and, and seeing how human capital is not just something that's isolated within the HR department, but understanding that, you know, if you've got your business strategy, you've got to make sure that you've got the right people to execute it, right? And that also, if you've got, if you're trying to become a more sustainable company, gosh, you've got to treat your employees well. Because oh, yeah. if you don't, you're, you're not going to, you can't go off and save the world if your employees are in food stamps. Well, and, and if they're turning over continuously, right. then they're not really the core of which, your knowledge. Which base. means that companies need to have better analytics when it comes to human capital. They've got to not just look at it as an accounting cost, but view this all as an economic cost, an opportunity cost. What do you lose when you've got that kind of turnover? Well, what's net zero? <laughs> That's a great question. I got to tell you, one of the biggest challenges in this whole area is just the alphabet soup, the different terms. What's the difference between one term and another? Okay. So net zero, I think, is a more intense version of carbon neutrality. So let me talk to you about what carbon neutrality is, which means that if a, if a company is emitting carbon emissions, they can offset it through um, reductions in carbon emissions elsewhere. So you're producing uh, pollution, uh, carbon emissions on one hand, well, you can plant trees in the rainforest, you can pay someone else to reduce their emissions elsewhere. Therefore, you get to carbon neutrality as a company. And, and, and you know, uh, people say, well, why don't you just stop doing the original thing? But if you're producing food you, to feed people, right. you're producing carbon. So your point is, you, you, yes. you, have, you have to produce, you, you, know, yes. you have to have an economy that, that works, right. provides for our, for our people. Right. But as you're doing that, find something else to balance, to balance. it. Right. And so okay. that's carbon neutrality. Net zero is the notion that you get to the same pl place, but before you get into offsets, you do everything you can to reduce your own emissions. And ultimately get yeah. to zero, zero. Right. carbon. Yeah. Why this focus on carbon? I mean, wh why not everything else? What well, is you it, know, what it, is, it, it is because of the connection between carbon emissions and climate change. Yeah. But I got to tell you that, you know, when you, again, this is looking at what consumers say, um, there is, of course, the, the, you know, the intense focus on climate, but there are other er environmental issues that consumers are focused on. And this is important for companies to keep in mind. Consumers care about things like the conservation of natural resources, which is related to climate, but they can care about that. They care about water. They care about plastics. They care about all the things going back to the 1970s, you know, about litter on the highways, clean air, clean water. Climate is just part of a constellation of environmental issues, often interconnected, right? Um, and I think that's important for people to keep in mind. So, and, you know, if you're reducing your carbon, you're also, in order to do that, yeah. you're reducing every other kind of emission, you right? Know, every other air, yeah. air and water emission, right? You're reducing waste because Correct. all of those things produce carbon. So it becomes the molecule, right. the yeah. least common denominator yeah. of all. Yeah, and you think about the connection between, for example, biodiversity and carbon emissions and climate change. So reduction in biodiversity contributes to um, climate change, and climate change also contributes to loss of biodiversity. So there's you know, a, a clear connection between these different elements. Okay, but now we're out of gas. There's a diesel shortage. We, you know, you can't get, you know, the, the Russian exports into Western yeah. Europe. We don't have the LNG ports to, you know, swap it out. Uh, we're kind of in a world of hurt. And now I'm hearing that, you know, everybody's going to fire back up their coal plants. We'll, so we're in a time of global stress. Yes. Do we just say, ah, oh, forget it. You know, we'll get back to net zero 100 years from now. Or what do you do? No, actually, I think now is the time to, for companies, um, to have a clear transition plan for getting to net zero. So 
this is one of the issues that's happened is in many cases, and this is a bit of a governance issue, in many cases, companies went out there with these bold targets of they're going to reach net zero by X year, right? And it was often management making those commitments. Um, sometimes they made commitments without fully thinking it through or fully involving the board. What you ought to be doing now is to say, look, we're in, we are in a world of hurt. We may be relying more on fossil fuels right now, but what is our true transition plan to get there? And that transition plan is going to come with costs. It's going to come with disruption. You really have to think through how you're going to get there. And, and that's, you know, the word, the terminology these days is how do you have a just transition? And I think companies need to be focusing on that. We're talking with Paul Washington about sustainability in times of stress. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. If you're enjoying this podcast and are interested in embedding sustainability into your corporate DNA, join us for our sustainability summit on July 14th and 15th at the Westin Hotel in New York's Times Square. You'll hear from some of our country's top ESG executives on how they integrate sustainability into their business strategy and operations. At the 2022 summit, you and your C-suite colleagues can take advantage of this historic opportunity to learn what the ideal ESG performer looks like, how reporting and rating systems are evolving, and how to make sustainability everyone's job. You'll also discover how to put purpose in profit and how to tell your sustainability story to consumers, investors, and the public. You can find out more about this in-person event coming to New York on July 14th and 15th at www.conference-board.org. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board, and I'm joined today by Paul Washington, the leader of the Center for Environmental, Social, and Governance at the Conference Board. So, Paul, we're talking about, you know, the environmental, right. net zero before the break. You know, sometimes in the game of soccer, a game that I never played, but I watched my children play, I learned that sometimes you have to kick the ball backwards on the field and in order to then reset and go forward. Are we kind of in that time now where we have to reset with all of this global stress? You know, I think we do in some ways. So, um, you know, this, this gets into the issue, for example, of where, for example, nuclear power sits in the future of sustainable energy. It's a little bit of a third rail for folks to, to talk about, but I think we need to, people need to consider at a minimum what role nuclear could play in, in a carbon neutral world. So that's taking us back some ways, but I think that needs to be part of the considerations that we're not taking a position on it, but I think people need to, to focus on it. Um, the other thing where we really need a reset um, or maybe some sort of an acceleration in some ways, is that you know, the folks who were over in Glasgow in, um, in this past autumn were many of the usual suspects. As I talked to a few people who attended- Glasgow? So Glasgow was, the, sorry, that was the um, climate change conference that the UN does, right? And so the, I've talked to people who were there and it said it was the same people promising to do more, which was great, but, there were so many people missing there. And we see this in the US. We see, for example, that when it comes to companies embracing, um, you know, or addressing uh, climate risk, it's about half the S&P 500 does so, but it's a small fraction of this. I think what we need is a reset in approach, which is let's, let's make sure that this endeavor to reduce carbon emissions is everybody's business, every company's business. Every company should be focusing on it. Um, every company, you know, no matter what your industry, you can do something. And let's celebrate the incremental achievements that all these companies are, 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 are making. Let's encourage them to do so. Um, because I think that if we're, just, if we're just focusing on, you know, the marquee players out there, and they're the ones who are out there making these bold commitments, we're not going to get where we need to be. So, you know, Paul, what do you say to the folks who say, well, you know, the United States is only 5% of the world's population, number one. Number two, we could eliminate all carbon emissions. But if, if China and India right. don't deal with it, it, it isn't going to matter. And we spin through the same air, you know, 12 hours later, yeah. but, but it's the same stuff. Well, you know, is this, 
should we just give up on it? Or no, you know, we can't tell China and India what to do. No, you, you, you can't. But, you know, but you can do a few things and companies can do a few things. You're right. So, you know, China represents, I think, latest data are 28 percent of the world's uh, carbon emissions. Uh, India is 7 percent. So that's 35 percent together compared to 15 percent for, for the U.S., so um, I think there are a few things you can do, not only through government agreements, but I actually think that you know, companies have, you know, U.S. buys a lot from China. And what we're seeing is that companies have a fair amount of power in implementing um, sustainability as part of their procurement practices. Up, so up do government supply chain up through the supply chain. And you can do it in a in a, in a productive, well, constructive okay, so, way, right? That's exactly right. The worst thing you can do, actually, if you're trying to do this, is just have a checklist and say, okay, company, you know, tell us what you're doing to do A, B, and C. That doesn't work. What you really want to do is to have a higher level strategic discussion with your suppliers and say, look, we're going to require us to get to this goal. This goal is in both of our interests. What can we do together, actually? What do you need to do? Maybe what do we need to do to lower carbon emissions? I mean, that kind of dialogue, that B2B dialogue, is going to be so critical because you got 69% of all procurement executives right now saying they're considering sustainability. You don't want to make this a check the box exercise. And, and, if, and if you're an NGO or a group or somebody trying to make change, the worst thing you could do is go attack. I mean, you know, yes. it's like a Monty Python show where, you know, <laughs> you're standing on top of the castle. You yeah. see the marauders coming up over the hill. You fill the moat. You know, you throw, you get the alligators in the moat. Right. You boil the oil, right? You defend the castle. Yeah. But, you know, if the peace emissary comes over the hill, you invite them in, you have dinner, you talk about yeah. it, and you can get to change. So it, the, the whole interaction here needs also to be constructive. Yeah. And so, you know, and it's on both sides, right? So I think the nonprofits, the activist shareholders, you know, they need to approach it to say, okay, here's what more you can do. This is what other companies are doing. It's an, a ton of constructive dialogue. And companies, too, you know, I, we are, in fact, seeing companies being more open to having that sort of constructive dialogue. What's happening, frankly, on the shareholder proposal front right now is that um, shareholders are actually less willing to compromise than in the past because the wind is at their back. And so, you know, this may pass a little bit, but um, I think there's a lot that's incumbent upon shareholder activists and also mainstream investors not to support, and they aren't supporting the most radical proposals. But you catch more flies with honey than with vinegar. Exactly so right. You, you've got to work quietly together yeah. Um, yeah. on this thing. Paul, oh, what's greenwashing? Oh, uh, so greenwashing is when a company um, makes itself appear or its products and services appear more environmentally friendly than they really are. So that's like, you know, I've got this little thing over here, so I'll talk about that when in fact yeah. I've got this big problem over and, there. It, that's exactly right. And companies get in trouble. And we talked to the head of impact investing at T. Rowe Price about this a little while ago. He said that the surest sign that a company is greenwashing is if they feature in their 150 page CSR report, corporate social responsibility report, you know, a lot of pictures and a lot of text about an initiative that maybe represents, you know, a fraction of 1% of their revenue, and they're not addressing the rest of their business. He said, and I think he's right, that that sort of thing undermines your credibility in everything you say. Yeah, so, it's, it, so it, it really is taking a small piece or a small activity, overstating it, and, you know, when, when they're, when they're bigger. So don't, don't make, don't do that. You don't know, let the tail wake the dog. Exactly, and habits. find balance in your disclosures. Yeah. Admit when you're not where you need to be. The other thing is just, you know, this isn't just about trust and reputation. This is about litigation. I mean, there is a threat of consumer lawsuits, uh, consumer law lawsuits, as well as securities law lawsuits, if you don't do this right. Yeah. And with disclosure law, you, you know, that can be considered. Yeah. Materially misleading. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Tesla was just, um, you know, if, if you look at Tesla, it, it, is, it has been packaged as the brilliant ESG company moving us away from fossil fuels, yeah. you know, yada, yada. They were just dropped from the ESG index. What, what, yeah. is, what is that? Well, you know, I, I can't 
comment on the merits of it, but I can tell you what I understand happened and sort of the broader implications of it for companies. So they were dropped because it's, you know, ESG has three components. So part of it was they didn't have a, an appropriate carbon plan. Now that wasn't about their business itself, you know, which is producing electric cars. It's the way they produce it. In fact, they've been in, you know, they recently settled with the EPA over their own operations pollution. So it was their own pollution, right? So even if you have the yes. greatest environmental so, product, right. your actions exactly are and important and how you get there. Exactly. That, you know, it's so important. And so they also got dinged for worker conditions and we won't even start on governance. So, it, you know, ESG. So, but what it says- Governance by Twitter. Yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. So, but what that says is, you know, I don't care if you're a windmill company. Yeah. That doesn't actually mean that you're necessarily a sustainable company because you may not be running yourself in a way that's actually sustainable for the company. So right? sustainability is not about, it's not just about Correct. the process yes. and it's not just about the product or the service. It's both. It's, it, it, it's absolutely. And one of the things that, um, you know, companies need to keep in mind, this goes to rating agencies. There are about 600 different ESG, not talking credit rating agencies, ESG rating firms out there. And, you know, sounds like a roll up opportunity. It, it, it's a roll up opportunity. But there's this quote about every great cause begins as a movement, becomes a business and degenerates into a racket. I'll let you decide whether we've tipped over from business to racket here. Um, but, you know, companies need to be very um, selective about what ESG rating firms they really care about, because many of them are a bit of a black box and, you know, they don't have a lot of sway. So our advice to companies is focus on a few where- But the top, really, there's a top couple, you know, just name yeah. them. There's a UN Yeah, these, you, well, that's the reporting frameworks, but you have Sustainalytics, you have MCSI, you have a few that a lot of folks deal with, but you know- But I, talk, talk to your shareholders, find out which ones are important. To that's them. exactly right. And, and the ones that, you know, have credibility, the ones that you have visibility into their process that will listen to you, focus on those top five or 10 and ignore the other 590. Okay, so on our march to net zero, we're trying to transform our energy use in this country, but the world, globally, but in this country. So, you know, uh, renewables are up to what, 18% or something like that. I think we have um, nuclear, which is another 10 to 15% and on the, coming down. But each one of these has their own issues. You know, right. the, the wind is episodic. Yep. It doesn't blow all the time. And when it blows, you kill raptors. And so there's right. that. When you put solar panels, which are almost all made in China, by right. the way, not made right. here, and they're made with rare earth minerals. And they, when you're done with them, they are an environmental right. nightmare, by right. the way. So you have to think about the supply chain. But you cover the desert and you yep. kill everything underneath it. So you have, and that's not sustainable. And right. then you have battery technology, which is the same thing, yeah. production, you know, destruction. So you have to be thinking, we have to be thinking about all of this. And it's a journey. Correct. So there's some people who say, let's cut it off right now. No oil. You know, the, yeah. they're sort of like the Luddites. Of the, but I think what you said is, no, no, no. You need to be, we need to be thinking about it more ratably. And, exactly. And, and it's a journey. It's a journey. It's a journey for every company. It's a journey for every country. It's, and, and you need to be not having a singular focus on one issue climate or a singular focus on one set of metrics, carbon emissions. You need to look at this in the broader environmental and social context. That doesn't in any way reduce the concern about climate change. In fact, I think it makes it more possible to address climate change if you do this in a staged and thoughtful process that looks at all the pros and cons as you do this. Because otherwise, if you don't, there's going to be more of a backlash. So half of the emissions from energy production, roughly, don't quote the exact numbers, but it's it's all, it's all half of it's coal. Yeah, I think it's 40% coal, 30-some is from um, oil, 20-some from gas. And of the coal, it's it, there are like 10 plants that produce half of all the coal. Mm -hmm. So if, if we could just take 10 plants, convert them to natural gas, it, you know, don't go all the way, you know, don't, right. don't try to boil the ocean. Just get those, we could get rid of almost 20% 
of yeah. emission. So it, it's this kind of thing where you have to you have to hit the low hanging fruit. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a combination of both that sort of targeted approach and um, this is something where every company needs to be engaged. And frankly, consumer culture changes. You know, because I think it, to, for this to be durable, right? Um, to be sustainable, indeed. You know, it's got to be embraced by everyone. We're doing a, a set of Chatham House World convenings, uh, discussions with our members on what a sustainability culture means uh, for a company. And one of the key concepts is a sense of ownership that everyone owns um, their part of this journey. Everyone has an estate in making their company more sustainable. And I think that's what we need as a society. So we need to look at sustainability from the beginning to the end of the entire chain. We need to have it be a productive journey. Mm -hmm. We need to keep the end in mind, but yeah. celebrate the success. Exactly right. Yeah. Paul Washington, thanks for being with us. My pleasure. Thanks for having us. And thanks to all of you for listening in to CEO Perspectives. Every week I'll be joined by an expert in their field to talk about the issues of our time. We'll talk about sustainability. We'll talk about human capital, ESG writ large. We'll talk about globalization. We'll talk about economics all the things you can think of. Please share CEO Perspectives with all of your friends, with your neighbors, with your relatives, with the cousins you haven't spoken to in years. It, I know they're going to want to listen. I'm Steve Odlin, and this series is brought to you. You've been listening to a podcast from the Conference Board, your source of trusted insights for what's ahead. For more on the subject of sustainability and how to integrate it into your business strategy and operations, join us for our Sustainability Summit on July 14th and 15th at the Westin Hotel in New York's Times Square. This in-person event will gather some of the nation's leading executives in the ESG space for a look at what's ahead. You can find more at www.conference-board.org.